Welcome to The Blind School, Pioneering People and Places. This exhibition is divided into five sections, or chapters. Hello and welcome to History of Places exhibition on the Royal School for the Blind in Liverpool. I'm Beth. And I'm Jordan. We are both actors and we both identify as disabled. Today, we are going to take you through the history of the School for the Blind. You are now at Chapter 1, The Origins of the School. This school was founded, as you may have guessed, here in Liverpool in 1791. It was the second of its kind in the world. Our first founding figure is... Edward Rushton, poet and anti-slavery campaigner. On one of my voyages on a slave ship, I contracted an infection which left me mostly blind. In 1791, I was inspired to establish Britain's first school for blind people. In fact, a number of the founders were blind. A young blind man called Henry Arnold is also recorded as suggesting the project, and Rushton was assisted by blind musicians John Christie and Robert Lowe in gaining support for his suggestion of a school. I believed an association should be formed consisting entirely of blind people, as the sufferings of the indigent That means poor. Blind but great! I was resolved to persevere! Welcome to Chapter 2. The school moved location a lot for a variety of reasons. In 1791, the school was located at two lodging houses at 6 Commutation Row, opposite Central Library and close to St George's Hall. This quickly became too small for the 52 pupils, and in 1797, the architect John Foster designed a new building. I did indeed design this island for the indigent blind. Later, the School of Industry for the Blind. Well, that's a slightly better name by today's standards. Well, well, asylum means sanctuary, and my building allowed the 68 pupils to board for the first time. Welcome to chapter 3, Craft and Leisure. We are now coming to the section about learning a craft. This was, as Rushton described it, To afford relief to those who were labouring under the complicated misfortunes of poverty and blindness, where, by being engaged in different occupations, their minds might be relieved from the fatigue of inactivity. So, when you don't have anything to do and you feel unhappy and like you have no purpose, I'm sure lots of us have felt like that and creative outlets can be a great antidote. We made baskets. There is some in front of you. We knitted and we made tea trays. There was this lady who said she really wanted the stuff we sold at the shops, but it was, what was it, too elegant and out of her price range? There are also some of these. You can also feel some of the games pupils used to play, like dominoes. Pupils also learnt piano tuning and brush making. In 1936, the Liverpolitan newspaper reported that usefulness abounds in this blind asylum. It aims to train our sightless brothers and sisters in various trades and crafts to teach them to forget the handicap of useless eyes. What? Obviously, we don't think that it's acceptable to talk like that anymore. Blind and visually impaired people may choose to identify as disabled. This means that society is not designed for them and they need to find other ways to do things and the school provides that. Welcome to Chapter 4, Life at the School. On the wall in front of you are mounted screens which will each show an oral history of former pupils. Frank McFarlane and Steve Binns, MBE. Shall we look at the evacuee diary now? <laughs> In 1939, at the start of the Second World War, pupils at the school were evacuated to Rill in North Wales. This evacuation diary gives us a rare insight into the pupils' perspective, describing the journey. Through the wonderful Mersey Tunnel for the first time, fun, laughter, singing all enjoying it. At 8.30pm, banshee wailing shattered the peaceful night, since there were so many of us, we went to the kitchen, the safest room in the house. Beds were brought down. The all clear sounded at 1.20 a.m. As we said, the school was a charity, so it relied on donations. 
To persuade people to give generously to the school, pupils were often portrayed as objects of pity. Many disabled people now reject this charity model because it perpetrates the idea that disabled people need charity instead of rights. Partnership schemes are more successful. For example, every July, the Liverpool Hackney Drivers Club take pupils on day trips. Drivers decorate their taxis to compete for the best dressed reward. Those cab fairers were wonderful to us. Remembers former pupil Steve Binns, MBE. New inventions and technologies mean greater equality and choice about where and how we wish to live and work, though we still have some way to go. Chapter 5 Being Blind Mounted on the adjacent wall is a screen showing a short film entitled Visions, which was made by young people from St Vincent's School for Sensory Impairment. As former pupil Frank McFarlane puts it, you can be the best whiz kid in the world, but if you can't get to work, then you haven't got a job. Though not without controversy, the blind school in Liverpool was, and still is, instrumental in helping hundreds of people live independent lives. This concludes our audio description. Thanks for joining us. For more information on today's exhibition, please visit our website at www.historyof.place.